My name is Jen Benedet. I'm the California Statewide R3 Coordinator, and I'm going to be your huddle moderator today. I'd like to welcome all of you and give you a chance, especially those of you who are new here, to get the rundown of, on what the Harvest Huddle Hour is. We call the Harvest Huddle Hour R3H3. It's a virtual program meant to engage with beginning adult audiences that are just starting out or returning to their journey in hunting, fishing, foraging, and the shooting sport. The information provided during these huddles is meant to be a resource for you and to build confidence and excitement around consumptive use activities to get you into the outdoors. Of course, these sessions are only an hour long and don't cover everything, but they do give you an opportunity to engage with subject matter experts to get your most pressing questions answered, and I'll get into how you can ask those questions in a little bit. Today, we have two expert anglers who are hooked on bass fishing and ready to share their excitement with you. But before we get started, we have some quick housekeeping things to go over. If you're new to Zoom, which sounds super silly to say today, you can change the way your screen looks by clicking on the top right icons. There are two views, gallery and presenter. Feel free to play around with it. What you select won't affect anyone else's screen. Also, there's a slider that's located in the middle of your screen that will be important for you to use today. You can drag that left or right to make the video or the presentation larger. Both of our presenters are going to be using a presentation today. So if the text or pictures on that presentation seem small, go ahead and just grab that slider and drag it so the presentation side gets larger. Um, also, at the end of the session, there's going to be an opportunity for the audience to ask Q&As with our presenters. You'll see a Q&A feature. It's located at the bottom middle of your screen. Please use that to submit questions throughout the presentation. You do not need to wait to the end to ask questions using that feature. Um, I will pick up questions that you ask and feed them to our presenters during the live session of the Q&A at the very end of the presentation. So as questions come up throughout uh, the one hour time slot, ask away. They're going to just sit there until I grab them and ask during the live session. Um, and also feel free to ask a million questions if you want to know all the things because nobody can see them except me. So we also do our best to answer everyone's questions during the event, but if for some reason your question doesn't get answered or if it's outside of the scope of today's presentation, please go ahead and submit your questions to our R3 email and one of us will get back to you. Uh, I will drop the email into the chat box for everyone, but otherwise it's uh, R3 statewide programs at wildlife.ca.gov. Um, also, there's no need to write down links and resources and names of things that are shared because this afternoon you'll receive a resource email to the email address that you use to register for today's presentation. Um, you can also find things on the R3 webpage, which will be included in that resource email, but that web address is wildlife.ca.gov forward slash R3. Um, along with those resources, you can find past recordings of the R3H3 under the California Wild Kitchen tab. I know I just threw a ton of information at you, but don't worry, we'll email it all to you again. <laughs> so now for our presenters, I'm going to go ahead and introduce today's presenters so we can get started. So we have uh, two great presenters today. We have Monty Courier and Max Fitch. Monty Courier grew up in East Tennessee. He was introduced to fishing by his grandfather and mom. And ever since, he's had a passion for angling and the outdoors. Monty earned a bachelor's degree in wildlife and fishery science from Tennessee Technological University and started his career working for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Central Valley Salmon Monitoring Program for four years before taking a job with CDFW in 2001. He primarily wor works with Chinook salmon, steelhead trout and bass, and his goals are to improve sport fishing. His favorite part of his job is introducing children to aquatic education and angling while administering the Fishing in the City event. And then we have Max Fish. He has been a biologist with CDFW for 15 years. He spent about half the time working on fisheries in the estuary from the California Delta to San Francisco Bay. The other half has been spent working on inland sport fisheries throughout the state. He has worked specifically with white sturgeon, California halibut, black bass, Sacramento perch, and landlocked salmon fisheries, among others. So thank you both for joining us today. We're so excited to have you and to see your presentation. And with that, I think we will jump right in. Um, take it away, Monty. Uh, thanks, Jen. I appreciate it. Uh, once again, I'm Monty Courier, I'm an environmental scientist. I've worked for the department for 21 years. Bass fishing is a big passion of mine, and hopefully we can give you a little bit of overview of uh, California bass fisheries and just you know the what you kind of expect and help you uh, be more successful and possibly catching a few fish so 
Uh, without further ado, let's get started. Let's talk about bass. And it's R3, Huddle Hour. And once again, I'm Monty Courier. I've been working for the department for quite some time. It's a, it's a joy to be here and talk to you guys today. Why do I fish? You know, the fish don't care if I'm rich or poor or how big my house is. Uh, they don't criticize or ask too many questions. They don't care if my jokes are funny or if my clothes don't match. The fish challenge me, they relax me, they captivate me, comfort me. The fish help me connect with nature, remind me of what is important. They help me slow down and appreciate time with friends and family. You know, they just make me a better person. They make me happy. And, and you know, that's something as a child, I just uh, thought fish were fascinating and it kind of steered me towards this career that, that I have today. So why do you guys, you know, bass fish? Why are you interested in it? What are the benefits? Well, is it, you know, a hobby or just to go out and relax, be outside? You know, you can spend time with family and, you know, it's an individual, you can do it with both. It creates good memories. Um, sometimes it can be you know, physically taxing, you know, it's good exercise. Some folks take it to the next level. I've done a few of those, uh, you know, bass fishing competitions. They're really fun to kind of challenge yourself and see how you stack up against other anglers. In other words, just enjoyment, excitement, the thrill of the next tug. They say the tug is the drug. So uh, California uh, currently has uh, six species of, uh, of black bass, which would be the Alabama bass, uh, the Florida bass, uh, the northern strain, the red eye or the coosa bass, smallmouth bass, and the spotted bass. So um, we'll talk a little bit further, uh, further in the presentation about the differences and how you can tell. So largemouth, uh, that's the number one bass that are kind of sought after by anglers, you know, worldwide and, you know, in North America. They were introduced from Illinois into California in 1891. You know, and some characteristics about largemouth bass, they consume mostly small baits, freshwater shrimp, and insects. Once they become an adult, they consume smaller fish, you know, shad, snails, crayfish, frogs, pretty much anything, you know, that's why they call them largemouth. They fit. They have a very, very, you know, large mouth compared to their body size, and they pretty much eat, you know, prey is 50% the size of their body uh, or larger, and sometimes they bite off more than they can chew, as you'll see in a slide later on. Um, they, they basically say the studies uh, of prey by largemouth show that weedy waters uh, bass grow more slowly because it's more difficult to acquire prey. Less weedy cover allows bass uh, easier chance to catch prey, but you know sometimes it also uh, causes a problem and they tend to eat themselves out of house and home. Uh, there's a difference between a healthy and a stunted uh, bass. This fish here on the left. Uh, it's stunning. See how skinny it is. It's emaciated. It's got a large head. This is excellent about that. The one on the right is uh, what a, a bass typically should look like. Uh, just kind of uh, chunky, robust. Some people say they have shoulders, you know, they, they're just kind of wide. And, uh, you know, that's a difference. If you are fishing a body of water and you catch a fish on the left, that uh, fish population is out of balance. So there's some facts I'm going to give you guys about uh, tournament fishing. And, you know, when they do uh, bass tournaments, all of them are catch and release. And the first bass tournament was started in 1967, founded by Ray Scott and BASS. Uh, the first catch and release tournament, the early tournaments were basically catch and keep. And, the, uh, you know, most fisheries managers saw that that wasn't sustainable. So the first catch and release tournament was 1972. Uh, the first college uh, fishing contest was in Indiana in 1992. And so, yeah, your kids could earn a, you know, bass scholarship if they really get into it. Some of the high school uh, have started uh, high school fishing teams, and there's one here in the North State, and I know there's several around the Sacramento area and farther down where we're encouraging young folks to get involved into bass fishing competitions. And just like uh, organized sports, you know, football, basketball, baseball, whatever, they can actually earn, you know, a uh, scholarship to go bass fishing college. So there's uh, popular uh, tournament circuits or FLW, the Forest L. Wood, which is the originator of bass, you know, uh, Ranger bass boats, Bassmaster, Cabela's, another one that's real popular now, it's called the MLF. So if you guys really like bass fishing, not just, uh, you know, going out and doing it, but actually watching, seeing what's going on in the bass fishing world, 
there's lots of cool things to see on ESPN and different things. So if I'm not fishing uh, for bass, I, I'd like to watch it on TV too. So yeah, that's a real thing. People make lots of money. So the most money ever made by a, a professional bass fisherman is Kevin Van Dam. He's kind of like the Michael Jordan of bass fishing. He has uh, won over $6 million just in prizes and, and uh, cash, not, in, uh, not including his endorsements. So uh, it can be quite profitable. Uh, the most notable California angler, Skeet Reese. Uh, he's out of like the, um, uh, the, the Sierra area, I think, um, out of Sacramento. He's won over $3 million and he's still competing. Both of these guys are still competing today. But they're great, both of them are great ambassadors. Largemouth bass, scientific name is Microphyta salmoids. And here's some prime examples of uh, what you can see. Uh, lots of money is spent on bass fishing every year. A 2012 survey uh, found that $16 billion uh, annually was spent on bass fishing alone. So they get large, they're fun to catch. They're just, uh, you know, these larger fish are very elusive. I've never caught one quite this big, but uh, here's some examples of some amazing growth and size and trophy potential of largemouth. Bass grow, you know, they, they live long uh, up to, a, a, you know, a lot of variables, including, you know, their genetics, uh, what forage species are around, what food they have to eat, what the climate's like, uh, what the water quality is like. So just some, uh, Florida stream usually gets the largest, but uh, just some characteristics. Largemouth bass, they have very large mouths. Their jaw extends past the eye. They're very kind of robust and chunky. The northern strain, you can tell between the northern and southern strain, if you actually count the scales, which is very tedious and hard to do, but uh, just right there where that black stripe is. You can actually count those lateral line scales and you can tell the difference. They prefer different habitats between the Florida strain and Northern strain. So just some ways to positively identify the differences between these subspecies. So, and uh, you know, the Florida strain were introduced after the Northern strain into California and they were first uh, put into Southern California Otai Reservoir in 1959. George Perry, he had the world record up until a few years ago. This fish here on the right it was from Lake Montgomery, Georgia. It was uh, around 21 pounds. This fish on the left, uh, they nickname it Dottie because of the dot here on the, uh, the lower uh, jaw area. It was caught at Lake Dixon down in uh, Southern California. And uh, you know they get to be very large sizes. They, they just consume everything. They're top of the line predator in most systems. The new world record uh, was called Lake B with Japan, it was 22 pounds. But here's Dottie, she was 25 pounds when she was caught um, in 2006 at Lake Dixon, but she was caught on the outside of the mouth for it to be a legal catch and for you know that angler to be able to verify that as a world record. It had to voluntarily bite the lure and it, it didn't do that. So it was basically snagged, but we had to release it. Uh, so the current California state record is 21 pounds. Uh, at a Castaic Lake. And so there's one out there, I know it. Uh, here's a, a, another uh, amount of Dottie from Lake Dixon. She was 25 pounds when she was caught in uh, 2006. Uh, and she was found dead at 19 pounds, floating at 2008. And now uh, she's uh, hanging on the wall there. And we're going to talk a little bit about largemouth or just black bass in general to spawning. Largemouth, uh, they usually reach sexual maturity and begin spawning when they're about a year old. Spawning takes place in the spring season, usually in shallow water less than three feet, uh, when the water temperature holds around 65 degrees. And where we live in the western region, and it usually occurs uh, from April through June, and the females are typically larger than the males are. So when you see them on a, a spawning bed, or they call them reds, uh, the female is the larger of the two. And uh, usually it kicks off when the water temperature gets steady at around 65 and during a full moon period. So smallmouth are another uh, black bass species. Smallmouth and another bass, uh, spotted bass, uh, they tend to spawn around the same times, around the same water temperatures. They prefer the gravel substrates. And here's just a picture of a typical smallmouth couple uh, digging a nest. And where I live up in Redding, California, 
I found this off of a Mystery Tackle Box website, and it's kind of cool to see the, you know, the delineations between spawning times. So you see the southern latitudes here in North America, they tend to spawn in February, March, and where I live and where a lot of you folks live, you can kind of look at the bands and see when, if you were going to go uh, target those spawning fish in shallow water, that's about the time of the year you're going to find them. So what do bass do uh, when they're not spawning? Well, here's a good schematic that I found. It just kind of talks about, you know, the pre-spawn, they'll kind of stage up on points, those kind of things. And so these are areas when you're out at reservoirs, kind of, or even river systems where you find bass, kind of typically find them seasonally. Best rated largemouth uh, waters, a lot of them are in California. California and Texas are kind of go head to head on which one has the, the I guess, the best fat black bass fishing in North America. Florida uh, is right up there as well. So Clear Lake is ranked number three by Bassmaster Magazine. And the fish were, you know, largemouth were planted in there in 1888. And we usually, as a, the department, don't keep uh, records, lake records, but the record that I did find uh, for Clear Lake was 17.52 pounds. So very large fish, very, you know, a great lake to go fish and have success. So if you guys live around that area, uh, if you don't you know, want to get into bass fishing, that's one of the best places to go catch a trophy. So here's a couple of photos of uh, different fish that you can pull out of Clear Lake. I mean, people flock there from all over the world just to go pursue a trophy sized fish. Diamond Valley Reservoir, it's down in Hemet in Southern California. It's ranked number seven. And here's a, a couple of uh, photos of the potential trophy uh, bass that you can get, especially largemouth. It was planted in 2000, and the lake record is 16, just over 16 and a half pounds. California Delta, here's a couple of other unbelievable robust fish. These fish we go down and collect every year for the Sacramento Sportsman Show, the ISC show. And this gives you a good representation of what's available there for anglers. The California Delta record is 18.62 pounds. Once again, very large, very robust fish. Uh, unbelievable. It's probably the favorite thing I do besides my kids' fishing programs every year uh, when we get a chance to go down and collect fish for that exhibit. Uh, we're going to move on to the, a different black bass species. Alabama spotted bass was introduced, uh, or actually this is the new world and state record. Alabama spotted bass was caught by Nick Dulick in 2017. Uh, it's 11 pounds, four ounces, and that stood to this day. And it's an Alabama bass. It's different than the, the uh, straight up spotted bass, Northern strain. And it was stocked in California in 1974 at Paris Lake down in Southern California. Once again, here's another uh, great example of an Alabama bass. Uh, Cody Meyer is a professional angler and he's had quite success uh, catching fish there at Bullard's Bar. For the spotted bass, they, they have a smaller mouth, their upper jaw extends to the middle of the eye and they usually typically have a patch of teeth on the tongue. So if you catch that fish, you put your thumb right there on the tongue, you'll feel kind of like sandpaper. And Alabama uh, bass, is, uh, you know, they have 71 scales, they grow faster, um, and they have a smaller tooth patch and they're longer lived than just the straight up northern strain spotted bass. Here's a fish from Lake McClure for you guys down in Central California. They have the potential of producing some really nice fish. This fish is, you know, 23 inches, uh, very, uh, great predator. They feed, you know, at all water levels, shallow, deep. That's what makes spotted bass uh, do so well in these fluctuating reservoirs we have here in California. Shasta Lake, where I manage, um, is a unbelievable. We have 365 miles of shoreline, not currently due to the drought, but uh, great potential to catch a large, large mouth, large spotted bass too. Some of the records that we have here at Shasta Lake still holds is uh, Arnold Vincelli caught a 15 pound largemouth back in the late eighties. And recently Jeep Shaver just caught a 10 pounder in 2017. Trinity Lake is also kind of a hidden gem up in Northern California, it has a great complement of largemouth, smallmouth, and it's uh, almost 
completely in touch except for the springtime. So if you guys are looking for a great getaway in the summer to get out of the heat, Trinity Lake is a great place to go try to catch uh, your trophy bass. Okay, we're going to look at now at some of the differences between, you know, if you, you catch a fish and a lot of folks have a hard time telling the difference between a spotted and a large mouth. Well, as you see here on the, the top fish, that's a large mouth. You see how that top jawbone, the mouth, the lip goes past the eye. And there's a greater distance between the mouth, the, uh, they call it a maxillary, between that and the eye. As you see, the bottom fish is a spotted bass. Also, uh, if you look down below this central line here on the, the uh, spotted bass, they tend to have kind of spotted lines. So that's a great indicator that that's a spotted bass just from not having to stick your you know, hand into the fish's mouth and feel for the tooth patch. Uh, it's just a, a good indicator of what you have in your hand when you catch it. Smallmouth, we're gonna move on to another black bass species uh, introduced in California in 1874. This is probably my favorite of the black bass. Uh, they really uh, have distinct differences as far as the, the way they appear, you know, in dark water, the fish on the bottom right hand side, dark brown, you know, they can be olive, they can be bronze, some people call them bronze backs. So they're very aggressive. They do uh, really well on fly fishing uh, for these fish. They live a lot of times uh, in streams and rivers, especially that, that flow into Sacramento River or any of that, like on the Russian River on the coast. Uh, they're very aggressive and just very acrobatic. Uh, I would say they're probably right up there with trout as far as being able to uh, stretch your line out and give you a thrill. They, the state record is currently from Hardy Reservoir. It was caught in 2007. It's nine pounds, 13 ounces. Another bass that's kind of not well known is the red-eye bass of the Micropolis Cousse. It was introduced from 1962 in Tennessee into the Stanislaus River, Alder Creek, and others. Um, the closest clo uh, to where I live is Lake Oroville. They show up there every once in a while. They're very uh, small bodied fish. They tend typically live better in streams, but it's probably the one of the prettiest basses you'll ever see. They typically have a red eye. They have white leading edges on their fins and uh, there's no current state record. But if you catch one that's a pound and a half or so, I used to catch these all the time in Tennessee when I was in college. A fantastic fighting fish, just really, really fun to catch, but uh, the body size, uh, they just don't grow too large. Once again, you know, all fish species, aquatic species really need the complexity of a, a real robust food web to really uh, do well and persist. And this is just kind of uh, how everything's interconnected. So if you remove one of these uh, variables, one of these you know, food items or whatever, the rest of the food web suffers. So it's just kind of uh, what we're seeing, you know, just in all aspects uh, of you know, animals, you know, everything's kind of interconnected. It's, it's a real complex system. And so uh, you know, that's what we try to do is when we do fisheries management to make sure that it's a healthy ecosystem and also provide a great uh, fish uh, opportunity for you guys. So some of the food items when they're really small and honestly, smallmouth bass and spotted bass, I think they prey on uh, insects a little bit more than a lot of folks uh, probably know, but they eat stoneflies, mayflies, terrestrial, uh, they eat crayfish. They eat, you know, this is a, uh, um, a dragonfly nymph. And they'll eat those, that's a mayfly on the bottom left-hand side. So they're opportunistic. They won't just uh, feed on bait fish. They'll feed on whatever's there and whatever's available and plentiful. So uh, one of the reservoir uh, creatures that the bass do feed on is uh, is this uh, Fred Finn Shad. Sorry, I've got a phone call coming in. Hopefully that will, uh, hold on just for a second. My apologies. The thread fin shad. Another one is the inland silver side and golden shiner, which you guys are probably most familiar with if you've used any bait fish. This is the one that most people go and purchase at the bait shop. And those are very effective for catching bass. 
So once again, you know, bass are opportunistic, as you see here on these, they'll eat other fish. I mean, really large size. Uh, one on the upper right-hand side is a, probably a stock trout. And uh, they like to eat things. They eat other fish called uh, centrarchids, which, you know, fall into like bluegill, crappie, um, warmouth, any of those kind of sunfish that we have here in California. They chew on pretty much anything they can. So this is kind of a, a good thing uh, to see. You know, it's kind of sad. They eat, they eat baby ducks. They, eat, as you see here on the bottom left-hand corner, they bite up more. They can chew a lot of times, and sometimes they they'll die um, trying to consume a larger prey item than what they can actually get down. But as you see, they they have a large mouth. They are very voracious predators. They eat terrestrial uh, creatures. You know, mice, rats. This one here, I read an article and I thought this is cool enough to see this guy actually had a baby rattlesnake try to get on his canoe, he ended up uh, dispatching it with a, uh, with a paddle and then put it on a hook and threw it out and caught several large mouth off of it. But the amphibians, frogs, pretty much anything. But I think why California has such a, a great large mouth uh, program or basically uh, opportunities and to grow so large is our um, stocking program, our hatchery stocking program. They love to key in on trout. So that's why a lot of times you see these professional anglers catching trophy fish with um, big swim baits. And where and how to catch bass. You catch them in ponds, you can catch them in rivers, streams, creeks, pretty much anywhere where you find warm water, lakes and reservoirs, and uh, types of fishing rods or you know, choices are kind of endless. And Max will go into that a little bit later on, uh, different types. And they don't have to be expensive. You can use whatever. But uh, bait choices also, you know, of course, minnows, you can use natural. You can use earthworms. You can use crayfish. You can use crickets uh, where it's allowed. So they're pretty much not real picky. They'll eat pretty much anything. And here's a couple of typical setups with bobbers, or if you want to use split shots or weights, Carolina rigs, those kind of things. So this just kind of gives you an idea of kind of how to rig it up and catch bass. Uh, they, they, like I said, they'll eat soft plastics, hard baits, spinner baits, uh, flies, and you know, as you see here on the bottom, they come in all shapes and forms to mimic all kinds of uh, critters, aquatic critters. I uh, want to talk a little bit about the CDFW uh, Bass uh, Trophy Program. And basically, if you want to apply for that, it's kind of fun. You know, at large mouth, you have to catch one over 10 pounds. You submit it to Inland Fisheries Branch. Uh, Max approves all these. Or a spotted or smallmouth bass over six pounds. So, yeah, it's a, it's a cool program. It's kind of like the Heritage and Wild Trout Program that we have, but it's for black bass. So you get a certificate that you released it, but all you have to do is basically have the length, uh, the girth, fill out the form, send it in, and uh, Max or Inland Fisheries Branch will send you a certificate and a pen. So that's what the form looks like, and it's available on, on our website, or you can call any of the local office and, and uh, submit it, and we'll get it uh, to Max. Once again, you, know, you can kind of see the size of how the big that swim bait is to catch these very large bass. Uh, you know, that's a 14 inch bait, something like that. Not everyone uh, has the strength or the patience to throw something like that on the end of a rod all day long. But uh, they say when you do, it's a large fish, you get a chance to catch a trophy. How do, you know, people like Max and myself improve uh, fisheries or bass fisheries in general? We uh, do, you know, sport fishing regulations and reviews. We do angler education. We also do habitat enhancements. Uh, the law enforcement has to go out and make sure that people aren't taking more than their daily bag limits. Uh, so they keep everybody kind of playing on the even field and keeping uh, a good balance between you know, the black bass and also the other fish that are out there in our reservoirs. And also, you know, elevation, the water temperature, uh, water management going up and down, uh, nutrient load. So there's a lot of complexities that go into having a healthy bass fishery. But, it's very important. Uh, the regulations really pay, uh, you know, pay dividends if 
uh, they're enforced and people all uh, you know follow those. And I thought this was kind of a funny uh, cartoon by Gary Larson, uh, Far Side. He just says, I tell you what, this means, Norm, no size restrictions and screw the limit. So yeah, they may have one good last day of fishing, that's for sure. And they don't have to pay attention to the regulations. So anyways, just a little bit of uh, comic relief on this. And I thought it was kind of funny. There's always time for fishing. That's my slogan in life. You know, I think uh, we get caught up on our busy day to day. Just go relax, go fish, go have fun, create some memories and, uh, you know, take advantage of the resources we have here in California. And what we do also is we put in fish habitat, you know, I've been part of that. And I know they do a lot of it in Southern California. So in areas that they don't have a lot of cover for sport fish, we'll put say Christmas trees or like uh, manzanita bundles and stuff. I've done that at a local park here uh, for the past five or six years. And it, it does lots of uh, improvements for the bass fishing. And why do we do it? it? Increases the young of the year survival, the small fish get a chance to go in there and hide in those branches have a place to feed and it also attracts um, larger bass and other predatory fish to those locations and it also gives you guys when you go out and fish these reservoirs or these places where we do habitat a place to actually start you know instead of trying to go to a big reservoir and go wow where do I get where do I start you just go to these areas where you see brush piles and you may have good opportunity to catch something and it also is a kind of a joke it snags a lot of lures that's true and I tend to go out and spend a lot of recreational time swimming around these brush piles and uh, I, I retrieve some lures. So, you know, when people go and fish those, I get some free tackle out of it. Uh, here's an underwater photo, of just some of the uh, habitat that I've installed and bass and other fishes do use it. So it's very beneficial. And here's a picture of kind of what it looks like. We weigh them down to the bottom create a big brush pile, and this is underneath a fishing pier. So folks that don't have a boat, it con congregates uh, fish species there, so it makes them accessible and attainable to the shore angler. Uh, how do we monitor a lot of this? This is an electro fishing boat that we use. It basically creates a current in the water, and the cost of one of these, they're not cheap. They're over $100,000, but it's a, it's a pretty cool uh, piece of equipment. You know, it's probably one of the funnest things I do to go out and uh, it has electrodes that go into the water and it has a generator in the back, creates a current and it works kind of like a bug zapper for fish, but it doesn't kill them. It just basically stuns them as we go along the shoreline. We have two netters on the front that dip them up and put them in a live well and we get, you know, biological information out of it. So it's just a, a real good piece of equipment. So not many of the fish get away and it's not lethal. And it's a, just a good way for us to kind of, uh, assure that the fishery is healthy and, and well-balanced. Uh, this slide here kind of shows uh, just kind of some abnormalities that we're always kind of looking for when we're out doing our surveys. We'll look for, you know, fish that have uh, deformities or we look for disease, but most of the time we look for small, medium, and large fish just to make sure that uh, we have all different types of uh, life, uh, life stages uh, for all these fishes that we're trying to manage for you guys to uh, go out and catch. So uh, we also do a fishing contest and where I live I usually do 65 of those so when people want to go out and have a bass fishing contest they send a permit into me and we make sure that they don't over harvest fish make sure that they have good uh, fish care they release the fish after their tournaments and there's not too much pressure put on, put on one body of water for bass, so we try to keep our bass fisheries healthy. And that's it for my uh, presentation today, and thank you very much, and, and we'll answer some questions, and I, I'll turn this over to, to Max. Thanks, Monty, that was a, a great background, good overview, and just a ton of, ton of great information. Um, let me get my presentation up here. All right. Um, so uh, my name is Max Fish. I'm a biologist with the department. Um, like Monty, I, I grew up with a fascination uh, for fish and, and uh, I started off young bass fishing, primarily ponds and creeks. 
Uh, as I got older and access to a boat, started fishing lakes and reservoirs more. Uh, but uh, I chased a lot of other fish too. And, and uh, so I, I give you this background as context for this presentation. I consider myself a casual bass angler, uh, but with a lot of experience. You know, I'm not a trophy hunter. I'm not a tournament angler. So I'm going to give you my perspective on bass fishing and, and my, my approach to it. Um, there's a lot of ways uh, to look at bass fishing, but, but this is my perspective. All right, so um, what I want to talk about is first uh, how to find a bass fishery. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about bass behavior, talk about how to approach a bass water for the first time or, or, or uh, a, a water you fished before, but at a different time of year. And then talk a little bit about specific tackle or techniques. So first, where to find bass. Um, you may have heard Monty mention warm water. You know, we refer to black bass as a warm water species. And what this means is that they're really most active in the uh, upper 50s, 60s, and lower 70s. That's kind of their, their happy spot in terms of water temperature. Um, but the great thing about California is most of the waters in the state are going to fall into that category. So um, you can find bass fisheries across the state. You can find them up in the mountains. You can find them out on the coast. Uh, you can find them from the Oregon border down to the Mexican border. So. Um, Typically, there's bass fisheries that are accessible to just about everybody in the state. Um, there's bass fisheries in a lot of our urban lakes and ponds, and that's where a lot of people get started in their sort of bass fishing career. Um, local creeks and rivers, and then of course our, our large lakes and reservoirs. So here's a, a graphic I pulled off of onthewater.com, and I thought it'd be helpful. It, it kind of is a, a calendar of where to find bass throughout the year. Um, and this pattern will really hold true across the state, but the, the timing and the magnitude may, uh, may be different depending on your latitude and your elevation as waters, you know, southern waters or low elevation waters typically warm up faster in the spring than your high elevation or your northern latitude waters. So we've got images here of bass at different times of the year. And these ones I have circled here are your kind of your winter time pattern. So uh, in the winter when lakes are cold, your bass are typically going to move down deeper because in the winter, the deeper water is actually the warmer water. Um, so they'll get a little less active. You can still catch them in the in the winter, but uh, they're not as active. They're not feeding as heavily, and typically they're just in, in some deeper water. So as waters start to warm up in the late winter, early spring, they go into what we call like a pre-spawn uh, phase. This is a transition phase where they're moving up out of their their winter pattern. They're not quite up in the shallows for spawning yet, but they're starting to feed real heavily, trying to store up all that energy for the, the rivers of the spawn. And they're, uh, they're getting shallower and getting closer to their spawning grounds. This can be a great time to target them. They're feeding heavily. They're real likely to take lures. Uh, they're getting a little bit more accessible from a, a shore angler. Uh, so uh, great time to target these fish. So then they move into their spawn. Uh, like Monty said, when water temperatures get into the mid 60s, um, and for largemouth bass, this could be this could be really shallow, um, you know, maybe two, three, four feet of water. And typically, the males will move up first, and they'll start building a nest. And uh, at at that point, the females, the bigger females, will usually be hanging off in slightly deeper water. If the males are building a nest in three feet of water. The females may be hanging off in eight feet of water. Um, and this is a great time to, to target them from the bank because um, a lot of times you can actually see them and you can cast directly to, to the fish you want to catch. Uh, it's a great time to learn about the fish behavior because you can watch them, get a good pair of polarized glasses. Um, and then, you know, if you are targeting these spawning fish, just remember that, uh, you know, these are the, especially the big females, these are the ones you want to put back so they can go ahead and spawn and, and get off the next year class for you to enjoy the following year. So after the spawn, they go into a post-spawn phase, which is similar to the pre-spawn. They're backing off the spawning grounds. Um, you know, when they're spawning, they're not feeding real heavily, but uh, a lot of times you can catch them just out of aggression because they, they don't want anything near their nest. So uh, they'll strike a lure out of aggression. But after the spawn, they've used up all their energy and they start feeding heavily again, uh, trying to get that energy back. Um, and another great time to target them, they're still relatively shallow, uh, accessible, and, uh, and feeding heavily. 
So in the summer, typically your, your fish will go into one of two patterns. You'll have fish that move off into deep water, uh, deep cooler water, and uh, they'll be chasing bait fish out in open water or offshore points, uh, offshore humps. And then you'll have other fish that will actually stay up shallow and, and really hunker down in, in really heavy cover, really heavy vegetation where they have shade. Um, so in the summer, you can target fish up shallow in the weeds, and you can also target offshore fish that are that are keen in on uh, schools of bait fish. And then in the fall, another transition period where they're kind of moving down deeper, getting ready for their winter pattern. Uh, again, they're feeding real heavily. Uh, they're not going to be feeding much throughout the winter, so uh, a good time to target them. Um, but just you know, keep in mind, this time of year, they're, they're starting to move deeper, so uh, you need to move deeper to keep up with them. All right, so bass feeding habits. Um, bass are, are visual predators. So, um, you know, if you're th trying to throw a, a brown colored worm in some brown muddy water, it's going to be uh, difficult to, to catch a fish. So um, they key off visual cues. You know, you want to throw out something that they're going to be able to see. Uh, but they also will use vibration through the water. They can sense it through their lateral line. So in that muddy water, um, you know, you throw something that, that creates some vibration and they'll be able to find it in that muddy water. And they're, they're ambush predators. So um, there are times where they'll be out in open water chasing fish, but for the most part, they're gonna use their surroundings to their advantage. Um, so if that's an offshore hump, they're gonna hide, hide under a hump and wait for the fish to come by, or they'll use a, a down tree to conceal them until some bait comes by. So as an angler, you keep that in mind and, and you try to think about the, the little lake and the structure and the habitat and how, how would a fish use that to their advantage and put your lure in, in a place where an ambush predator uh, can take advantage of it. Uh, so how to target bass. So, so there's some things to consider as you're going out to, to go bass fishing. Um, and one of them is, you know, if you want to catch fish, you want to maximize your efficiency by fishing where the fish are. And that sounds really simple. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if you're not fishing where the fish are, you're, you're kind of just out for a nice walk or a nice boat ride. And so the first thing is the fishery. You know, you, you want to make sure you've got bass in that fishery. A lot of them, you know, have them. But, uh, if you're fishing up at 9,000 feet with a big swim bait, chances are you're not going to be catching bass. Um, so, you know, make sure that you're at a fishery that has bass. And then second is the location and the depth, uh, kind of that calendar we were just talking about. Uh, the dead of winter, um, you know, up in the north part of the state, if you're throwing a lure in two feet of water up in the shallows, chances are you're not going to put that lure in front of a fish. So uh, make sure you're fishing an appropriate location and depth for that season. Uh, that season, the elevation or that latitude. So um, again, fishing where the fish are. And uh, another thing to keep in mind is what, you know, fly anglers, the, the term they, they coined is mass the hatch. So um, what are the, the fish eating? You know, keep your eyes open when you're out there fishing. If you see fish that are chasing bait on the surface, uh, you might want to throw a, a lure that mimics a bait fish. Um, or if, if you catch a bass and you notice that the the lips are all bloodied up from picking crawfish out of out of the rocks. Maybe throw a crawfish presentation. So try to match the hatch. Try to imitate the bait that they're naturally feeding on. Um, and then another concept is you know your finesse versus your re reaction baits and your approach. So when the fish are really active, um, sometimes you know a, a real aggressive presentation is going to trigger their bite. Um, but in the dead of winter or other times when the fish aren't as active. Um, you need to slow down. You need to throw a slower bait, something that moves real slowly and gives the fish time to, to creep up to it. So just a few things to consider. So that, I'm going to get into, uh, into some more of the actual the tackle, the lures. And um, this is kind of, again, my, my perspective. This is my tackle box. There's a ton of stuff out there. I encourage you to, to go online or talk to your local tack sh tackle shop and, and get other perspectives as well. But uh, but this is uh, kind of a glimpse into what I put in my tackle box when I'm going out bass fishing. So uh, we're, we're going to really focus on artificial baits. Uh, you can use live bait, like Monty mentioned, but the artificial baits I'm going to talk about are soft plastics and jigs, uh, wire baits, hard baits, top water, spoons, and flies. <clears throat> So here's a, an assortment of different soft plastics that I keep in my tackle box. Um, 
there's all sorts of stuff in here. Here's kind of your worm baits, uh, stick baits on the left. You got tube baits on the bottom. Some of them have straight tails, curly tails. You can get them in a million different colors. Um, they can all be really effective. They can be fished real slow, which is uh, you know this finesse approach, especially when the fish aren't real active. These are some worm hooks. Uh, a lot of them are weedless. This offset shank work weedless hooks, which are great for fishing in in weeds or heavy cover. Uh, the one at the top there is called a wacky wacky rig hook. You can hook them right through the center, and uh, they have a lot of action all on their own. You just let them sink and, and do their thing. Uh, here we have some grubs, some single tail, some twin tail. Uh, we have a fluke on top that kind of mimics a bait fish. And here are some different creature baits. Uh, you've got some crawdad imitations, salamander or lizard imitations. Um, and then there's other ones that don't necessarily imitate anything, but just have all sorts of appendages to, to get a bass's attention. And then jigs. So uh, there's some bear jig hooks there. There's one that has a rattle and a weedless skirt, so you can fish it through heavy cover. they are jigs that have blades on the front, uh, so you can actually swim them or chatter bait, so they make noise as you're fishing them. Uh, huge variety of different skirts or trailers you can put on them. A uh, lot of options, and all these can be really effective. So here I'm showing that these are just a couple bags of these stick baits, these worms here, and uh, I'm showing you this because. Uh, on the back of both these, there's a, a kind of a tutorial on how to rig them. Um, your Texas rigged uh, weed list with a weight in front of it, Carolina drop shot. Uh, so, you know, you don't have to do a lot of research. You pick up a bag of worms and, uh, and you've got really everything you need right there on the back. So we'll go into a couple of techniques uh, for fishing soft plastics and jigs. We'll touch quickly on flipping and pitching, punching. Uh, fishing weedless and weightless, and drop shotting. So uh, flipping and pitching is, uh, they're, they're techniques for doing kind of pinpoint accurate casting. Um, so when, when you're trying to pick apart a piece of cover and you're not just trying to fish that piece of cover, but you're trying to put your lure at a specific hole in that cover uh, where you think a fish is sitting, it's, uh, it's a technique where you can pendulum and swing your, your presentation out to hit the exact spot that you're targeting. Not a technique where you're going to cast very far, but uh, when you're in close and you really want to pick apart uh, a piece of cover, it can be real effective. Uh, and there's a ton of tutorials online that you can learn more about uh, flipping and pitching. Punching uh, is another real effective technique. Um, so punching refers to, you know, summertime and heavy weed cover. A lot of times, these bass will be up underneath those weeds and with traditional tackle and approaches, you just can't get to them. Um, and so what punching is you take a real heavy jig, um, you pitch it up on top of the weed mat and it's heavy enough, it punches right through the weed mat and gets down to the fish below. And you fish it on really heavy lines so that when you do get that bite, you're able to pull the fish out of the weeds without snapping it off. So a uh, real specific technique for a real specific situation, but it can help you out if you've got real heavy cover, heavy weeds you're fishing around. And weedless and weightless. Um, I threw this specific one up here because this is probably the rig that's responsible for 90% of the bass I've caught. Um, this is just a simple worm with a, uh, a weedless offset shank worm hook. Uh, the upper picture is, is how you would rig it while you're fishing it. Um, with a, a hook buried in the worm. And once the fish bites it, it exposes that point, you set the hook and, and you, you can catch the fish. And, um, you know, might not be the most exciting way to fish because you fish it really slow, but it, it's super effective. Um, you need the right conditions. It can't be windy out because it'll blow your, blow your worm, um, but you can just let it sink as, as deep as you need to to get to the fish and give it a twitch every once in a while and, and the worm does the rest. Um, most of the bites, you know, I've got, I, I probably see them before I feel them. Um, you'll see the line jump or you'll see your line just start swimming off when, when, you, when they're slacking it. So it uh, requires a lot of focus, but, uh, but can be really effective. So, you know, if nothing else, get a bag of worms and a couple of hooks and, and I think you'll find success. Drop shots, another real popular technique, uh, another finesse technique. Um, it's simply a, a worm uh, on a hook with a, with a weight below it. It could be a, a, an actual drop shot weight. It could be a split shot. 
uh, but it's a great way for, for finesse fishing and, and a, uh, targeting specific depth. If you've got fish that are suspended four or five feet off the bottom, you can put a four or five foot uh, piece of line between your hook and your weight and, and put that presentation right in front of them. Um, so another real, real effective option. So wire baits. Um, here we've got some spinner baits on the left. These uh, come in a variety of colors, sizes, weights, different uh, different types of blades. You've got the elongated willow leaves. You've got Colorado leaf uh, or blades. Um, and typically these are mimicking schools of bait fish. They're real effective in, in dingy water where the uh, visibility is not as good because they put off a lot of vibration that the fish can key in on. Uh, they're also great for fishing through grass or weeds uh, where you know if you're fishing something with a treble hook, it might hang up. Uh, so they, they go through the weeds a little easier. Uh, over here, we've got buzz baits, which are very similar to spinner baits, but they're designed to actually ride right up on the surface and the, the blades break the surface as they come across. So uh, when you have fish that are up feeding on the surface, these can be real effective and a, a real exciting way to catch them because you usually see the, the strike. Um, and they also have different blades that, that clack and make noise. So they just cause a lot of commotion on the surface. Another presentation that's become real popular over the last, uh, I don't know, five, 10 years is uh, Alabama rig, or it's also known as an umbrella rig, A rig. And uh, it's, it, again, you're mimicking a, a school of bait fish here. And uh, it's, a, it's a big, heavy uh, presentation, but it's real effective. It gets a lot of attention. Uh, you just need to make sure you're matching it to the appropriate rod and reel that can handle it. Um, and check the regulations, you know, uh, the number of hooks. So this one has five baits. Uh, only three of them have hooks. Uh, the other two are just dummy baits. So check the regs uh, where you're fishing to make sure you know how many hooks you can use on one rig. So here's uh, an example of some of the hard baits I keep. Um, I've got uh, some of these crank baits on the left that are mimicking mostly threadfin shad, which is a primary forage species for bass in a lot of our waters. Um, there's two piece or they call them broken back uh, or one piece and they have kind of a different swim, different wiggle uh, depending, the, the one piece tend to have a tighter wiggle to them. The two piece have a little bit of a wider swim. Uh, most of these are all floating baits. And so the, you retrieve them with pretty much a steady retrieve um, and the size of the blade is gonna, is gonna uh, determine how deep they, they swim to. Here are your lipless crankbaits. So these ones don't have that bill in the front of them, but they're all sinking baits. Um, so once you cast, you can count them down as far as you'd like to uh, before you start your retrieve. And then again, typically it's kind of a constant retrieve and they all have rattles in them too. So they're uh, a great option when you're fishing muddy water because they put out a lot of commotion and, and the fish can find them easily. And then here are some other uh, hard baits that uh, are mimicking uh, other species. So there's crawdad imitations here at the bottom. There's a fly and a, and a grasshopper. Um, and there's all sorts of other stuff out there too. So again, you know, matching the hatch, uh, you, you can find a bait there to, to match pretty much whatever the bass happen to be feeding on. And over here, we've got a, a jerk bait, which uh, is similar in design, but uh, it has a little different uh, technique where you're, instead of a constant retrieve, you're, you're kind of jerking it and then giving it slack, letting it sit. And uh, a lot of times the bass will hit it while it's sitting still. And down here, we've got a couple of uh, swim baits, um, which again, can be real effective, especially if you're targeting big fish. Um, that, you got a bluegill there too, which like Monty mentioned, is, is a favorite food of bass and also their kind of arch nemesis because these bluegill will come in while they're spawning and, and eat eggs. So um, especially during the spawn, these, these fish will, will hit bluegill just out of aggression a lot of times. So here's a box of spoons. This is the one picture that didn't come out of my tackle box. This is uh, from Tactical Bass and, and uh, I, don't, I don't do a lot of spooning for bass, but uh, I know it can be a real effective technique when these fish have have moved offshore, they're in deeper water, they're keying in on, on bait fish, uh, and you need to get down, down to them to make that bait fish presentation. Uh, spooning for them uh, can be a great option. So top water, probably my favorite way of targeting bass. You know, we talked about buzz baits earlier, and here are some other top water options. Um, here are poppers. So these are floating baits that have a, 
concave mouth. And as you jerk them along the surface, they pop or they chug water, make a lot of commotion. Uh, real exciting when the fish come up and hit them. These are prop baits, so uh, similar concept, but instead of chugging water with the mouth, these ones have little props or propellers on the on the rear. So uh, a lot of times you can pull these in with a more constant retrieve and they, they uh, disturb the water as you bring them in. When you need something a little more subtle uh, for top water, these are some walking baits that uh, they don't create quite as much commotion. Um, so you can kind of jerk the rod as you're pulling these in and they'll walk as they come in uh, and again, really effective. And probably my favorite, uh, favorite way to catch fish is, is throwing frogs. So these are a couple of different examples of weedless frogs where you can throw these right into the weeds and you hop them across just like a frog would hop across and the, the fish will smash right through the weeds and hit these and it's just real exciting when you get a, a top water frog bite. Flies, so, um, you know, there's flies that can mimic all sorts of bait as well. Um, you've got poppers over here, which same concept as the, the hard bait poppers, but in a fly presentation, you've got flies that'll mimic frogs, uh, bait fish, caterpillars, um, and uh, something that's become real popular lately as well as the, what they call a floating fly, which is basically suspending a fly below a, a, below a slip bobber. So you can target real specific depths. Uh, if you've got spotted bass that are hanging in 15 feet of water, you can put a slip bobber with a 15 feet leader down there and, and hang one of these uh, bait fish imitations or other flies right in front of the fish. Uh, and you can do that with your traditional spinning tackle too. You don't need to use those on a, on a fly rod. So rods and reels, um, you can catch bass on really just about anything. Um, so I, here's just an example of a few rods I have. Uh, here's a spin caster. Uh, they're an in, enclosed reel. They're great for beginners. This is the way I started my kids out fishing. Um, they have their limitations. Uh, they're really easy to learn, but uh, you can't cast as far. So um, you know, once you've graduated beyond uh, just learning how to cast, it's probably time to move on to maybe a spinning rod. Um, if I had to pick just one rod for bass fishing, it would probably be a, a medium or lightweight spinning rod. Um, they're great for casting light lures. Uh, you can cast them a long ways. The, the spinning reels these days have some great drag on them. Uh, so a real good all around rod and reel. You've got your bait casters, uh, which typically uh, you can have heavier drags. You can fish in heavier line on heavier rods. Uh, there's, there's a lot of lightweight options as well, but if you're throwing big heavy swim baits or Alabama rigs, uh, bait casting rigs is kind of the way to go. And then a fly fly rod. If you if you really want to focus on on throwing flies, uh, a fly rod might be the way to go. And unlike the rest of these that use the weight of the lure to to cast the line out on a fly rod, you're really using the weight of the line. So completely different approach, but uh, but you can certainly catch bass on on any of these. Uh, but the the main thing to remember is just match your rod and reel to the presentation. If you're throwing real light lures, you need a real light spinning rod or a fly rod. If you're throwing real heavy stuff, you need a heavier uh, heavier bait caster. So with that, you know, I just want to encourage everybody to give bass fishing a try. Um, you know, bass fishing doesn't require the investment of a lot of time or money. Chances are there's a, a bass fishery within a short drive, somewhere where you could go for just an afternoon after work. Um, it doesn't require a lot of tackle, you know, a cheap rod and reel, a bag of worms and a bag of hooks, and, and you'll find success. So a uh, great option to spend time with family outdoors. I love just going to the lake, walking along the bank with my family and, and making a few casts. Um, here in California, we've got bass fishing for every skill level. Um, like I said, there's there's little ponds all over the place that are chock full of small bass that are a blast to catch. Um, but we also, you know, we permit as a department about 1,700 fishing tournaments a year uh, throughout the state. About 95% of those are bass tournaments. So if you get into it, you feel like doing some competitive fishing. Uh, there's a ton of options out there, a ton of, uh, a ton of tournaments that, that, that you can get in on. And we've got, like Monty mentioned, we've got some of the biggest bass in the world. Uh, so if, if you're a, a trophy hunter and, and you're looking for that fish of a lifetime, uh, there's waters in the south part of the state and in the north part of the state where there's really a uh, state record, if not world record potential. So uh, just encourage you to get out there and uh, give it a try. And uh, with that, I'll 
Turn it back to you, Jen. Thanks, Max. Thanks, Lonnie. Um, I think uh, we are up against our time right now. It's just past one. Some people have dropped off probably because they were on their lunch break, but there are still some people hanging in. So I think we'll go ahead and just hop on into the Q&A. Um, you can stop sharing your screen so everyone can just see our faces, I think, from here on out. Um, and we have lots of questions that have rolled in, so we'll just get to it. Um, either of you can feel free to jump in and answer it, uh, or both of you can. So let's see. Um, we have a question that says, I haven't had much luck with catching bass. Any recommendations on the types of lures, baits, and line and weight that you can that you can target from the shore? So is there any, I guess you covered lots of that information, but what about if you're specifically fishing from the shore? And we do have some questions around whether or not you actually do need a bass boat to go bass fishing or not. So that's two parts. Thanks for that, if you'd like, Max. Uh, no, you, you really don't have to have a bass boat for sure. I do a lot of stream fishing, uh, and you get them, like Max says, from the shore as well. Uh, if I was going to pick one thing, I would pick like what Max said, medium, medium light spinning rod, and I would go probably eight pound test, and, and probably uh, finesse presentation will work pretty much 365. Uh, it's not as exciting, like Max says, with the uh, with the topwater frog, but I think uh, finesse fishing, the drop shot technique probably works the best, except for if you have a real weedy uh, situation, then I would probably go with more of like the spinner bait, uh, the buzz bait, the topwater, something like that. All right, um, another question. What if the temperature outside is 90 to 100 degrees or more? How does that affect bass activity? Yeah. So typically that's your summer pattern, right? So your fish are usually going to be one of two places. They're either going to be in deeper water, which is going to be tough to get to from the bank. But if you've got a boat, you can target those deeper fish or they're going to be up, up tight into some really heavy vegetation or, or cover. So um, if you're on a boat, you can, you can get down deep. You can spoon those fish. You can jig them. Uh, if you're on the bank, bank, you know, maybe you're throwing one of those frogs and, and trying to get those fish to come up through the weed mat. Great, thanks. So we have a few other questions. We'll try to wrap up in the next four minutes or so um, for those of you who are trying to hang on during your break. Um, are there different ways you should hold different types of fish? I think, um, you know, looking at the pictures that were shared, um, there may be a few different holds that, that were shown. Yeah, I can answer that. I mean, I believe that, you know, the, whoever asked the question, yeah, there was a few, uh, Issues with way those larger fish were being held straight up and down. I think that the you know the the best way to hold them is is putting your hand underneath their tail and underneath their chin or in their lip and holding them you know straight up, uh, not up and down, but just uh, I guess horizontal. It doesn't put so much stress on that jaw. So yeah, I, I mean if I was going to recommend how you would hold one for a picture or how you would basically use uh, to hold one and then release it. You know, you want to balance that whole weight of that fish, not just on that, that lower jaw. Max, did you have anything to add? I thought it looked like- No, that, that's right on. I think it's just, it's especially important with the big fish. You know, with, with little fish, they don't have a lot of weight. So holding them by their jaw isn't too big of a deal. But when you're talking about big fish, 10 pound fish, you want to support, support their body because that's a lot of weight to, to hang from their jaw. Right. We have a question, a couple of questions that are all sort of related. So I'll read all of the questions and then you guys can answer them. So um, how can you tell if hooks are weedless or what characteristics they have? Is it on the package? Uh, second question. There are lots of different lures that you mentioned. You used a lot of terms that I don't know. What's a skirt, trailer, rattle, et cetera. Is there a dictionary somewhere to refer to while we're shopping? And is it embarrassing to take that into a store? Um, <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Um, the, there, there was one more I thought I saw in here. Um, I guess that's it. Go ahead and, oh, the, there's some technique names um, that people had questions about. Technique names seem kind of mean. Punching, why is it called that? And what does fishing slow mean? So I think people are confused about terms and, and some jargon that's used. Yeah. Well, uh, I work at a, a sporting goods uh, store in the fishing department, and a lot of folks, uh, you know, we didn't come up with these terms. These are just kind of adopted through the fishing community, the bass fishing community. Punching, it just means, you, you know, you really have to hit that bait hard 
through vegetation to get it through. And I, I think that's where that name came from. Yeah, does it sound most politically correct? Probably not. Uh, and you're, you know, you're punching through the weed mat, not punching yeah. the fish. Right, right, not punching the fish. So, and I don't know why certain techniques are named uh, what they are, you know, they're just kind of adopted uh, by the people who created them and they just kind of catch on. And that's just how things go. Um, and is there a dictionary? Not that I know, but I tell you, I get a lot of information from Bass Master Magazine or any of the bass fishing magazines. Or if you go into like a sporting goods store um, and they will you know, definitely, you know, kind of uh, show you the different techniques, different baits and those kind of things. And hopefully that can help you out. Great. Um, we have people asking whether or not you can eat bass and what are the pros and cons to keeping or releasing the fish that they catch? Yeah, you, you certainly can eat, eat bass. Um, you know, again, check your regulations. Um, fishing tournaments are catch and release only, but uh, but bass can be can be delicious, especially fried up. Um, most fisheries have a minimum size limit, so check the size limit where you're going. But especially those you know medium to smaller size uh, spotted bass can be can be great fried up. Um, you know, I I personally wouldn't keep real big fish, but uh, if it's within the regs, that's that's up to you. So. Uh, I know, Bonnie, you've got your own take, too. Yeah, I would say the kind of the same thing. I tend to harvest smaller fish, especially on the spotted bass. I think it does the fishery good because spot, uh, spotted bass in reservoirs are very successful as far as the reproduction potential. And so I think if people would take those fish, harvest them, it would put less uh, spotted bass in a given body of water, less competition for food, and overall would create a larger fish, uh, maybe a trophy potential. So. I definitely encourage it. I eat spotted bass quite often out of large reservoirs. I tend to harvest them mostly in the winter time and make fish tacos out of them. And they, they rival pretty much any kind of, uh, even saltwater fish that are better than, in my opinion, than tilapia. And uh, my family and I definitely enjoy a uh, good fish taco. How does fishing for freshwater bass differ from salt? And can I use the same setup for both saltwater and freshwater? Um, I would probably say that you, uh, the fishing equipment they use in salt water, unless you go, you know, extra light, uh, it'd probably be too much. It'd be kind of overkill. And that's one thing I like about freshwater fishing. You use lighter equipment. Uh, it's a little bit more of a challenge to land fishing. It's not you're like pulling in a big crank and just, you know, bringing them right to the shore. You know, you have to set the drag. You have to keep the tip up. So it's a little bit more difficult. And I think uh, you might be able to get away with it, but I think you probably would enjoy it more if you bought lighter weight tackle to land freshwater fish, especially bass. Great. Well, thank you both. Our time together is up. If you didn't get your question answered, please remember you can always find resources on the R3 page that might help you, or you can email R3 statewide program at wildlife.ca.gov. And one of the R3 team members will respond. Please join us for our next R3H3 session on August 6th, where we will cover a day at the range, understanding different types of firearm ranges, etiquette, and how to navigate your first trip. You can find registration links by visiting the R3 calendar, by watching our social media, or signing up to receive the monthly Hunter Angler update through the online license portal. Lastly, a huge thank you to you, our attendees, for taking a step to educate yourself to becoming the best hunters, anglers, foragers, and shooters that you can be. Uh, this session's recording will be available on the R3 page in the coming days. Have a great day and a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye.